So, so let's define tribalism. What, what do we mean by tribalism? So I agree. I mean, I, I, you know, as you know, I, I constantly say the political spectrum is collectivism, individualism. Tribalism is a particular form of collectivism. It's what more characterizes simple. tribalism and how does it, how do you differentiate from other forms of collectivism? Yeah. To put it in, let's say, party line language, it's an epistemological choice or to put differently. It's the prism through which you choose the world and you choose to use that prism. So it's not an instinct. It's not unavoidable. It's a choice that you make. And this choice says, I will put on my tribalist glasses, my tribalist lenses, and I will see myself, others, and the world not as individuals. And I will judge them not based on reality. I will judge them based on what is my group interest. So you don't have as your starting point and as your arbiter reality, you have as your arbiter, what is the group interest? And this is, for example, why we see very often double standards, which is, let's give an example. Let's say, remember with Brett Kavanaugh that uh, the left was saying, look, we have to believe women. Here we have a serious allegation and uh, we have to take it very seriously. Maybe there's a merit there. There is a merit there. Let's say some years, last year, someone said something, an allegation about Biden. The same people who were saying when it came to Kavanaugh, believe women and say, come on, that's one allegation. It doesn't look to stand. Mm -hmm. And the same people who, when it came to Kavanaugh, they said, well, they're trying to ruin him. One allegation cannot uh, mean the end of his career. The same people would say, we need to, we need to very much examine this allegation against Joe Biden. This cannot go... So same situation or similar situations, completely different way of dealing and judging these situations. Why? Because again, your arbiter, the way, the, 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 your mode of thinking is not, what do I see there? What is actually happening in reality? Your mode of thinking is, which group is that person? Oh, is that group? Then I already know what the answer is. So this is in simple terms what, uh, what I see as tribalism. But there, and, but there seems to be another dimension of this, which is implied by what you say, but it's not, you, 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 we should make explicit. And that is that by doing that, right, you're implicitly and really explicitly rejecting your own individualism, your own individuality, and you're right. self-identifying yourself. That is, you're, you're, you're making your nature, you're making your, you're giving up your epistemology not to your thinking. It's not like you're evaluating the groups. You are now a member of the group. And to a large extent, as a member of the group, how do you know who the bad guys and who the good guys are based on what others in the group are telling you, right? Based on what's the dogma of the group. Exactly. And this is, this is very important. Most people think that tribalism is bad because it makes Twitter a toxic place or because it makes politics annoying. No, the number one problem with travel is what it does to your mind. Yeah. Because in a way you're switching off your mind. You are operating at a level which is way beyond what your mind should operate on. And it's in a way we could say it makes you stupid. Tribal, yeah. and I'm, I see this with myself quite often. I'm tribalistic and uh, I have a deep path, uh, sorry, past in tribalism. It's, in a way, you shut down your mind and you say, I will give up the thinking, someone else who is going to do the thinking for me. And for example, this is very clear, particularly in, let's say, in a communist party. I had an experience with a Greek communist party and part of any Marxist group is that party discipline means that once the party decides something, it is correct. And you could even say that, let's say the five people who take the decision individually, they're not clever, but because they are, let's say, the Politburo, somehow they have this common wisdom that mm -hmm. is going to come up with the right decision. And then you have to persuade yourself that, you know, I can see that this is wrong, but I have to follow the line. And actually to persuade yourself that you are wrong and the line is correct. So it's something very destructive to your mind. And that's the number one problem with tribalism. It's not that it makes politics what they are today, which is bad enough. It's mostly how you damage your own brain and you take away power from your mental strength. Yeah, and, and, and given that epistemology, integration is so important to our epistemology, even if you do it a little bit, it's only going to get worse. And it's only going to be, the, the destruction will spread. The destruction will go into every part 
of your epistemology and destroy your capacity to really think as an independent being. And I, we saw that over the last five years. We saw people dabbling with a particular tribe, not really adopting them, but slowly, slowly, slowly. And then within a few years, they're completely mindless followers without any self-identity, any And you see them on Twitter and you tell yourself, has this, this person has literally become more stupid? Yeah. How is it possible? Like this person used to write this very good, clever, well-reasoned things. And now this person is stupid. No, it's just that that person has given up their mind. Yep. Ha- that person is now thinking they're taking their marching orders, not from reality, but from the group or some, from some other people. From, from some authority that represents the group. So, yeah. um, so what do you think? Uh, have we always been tribal? Is tribalism just kind of a, the default for human beings is it, 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 you know, so, and then, you know, and if you want to touch on the kind of the evolutionary question, is this what we evolved to be? And, and, uh, and it's inevitable that we'd be tribal. So the problem here is that many people confuse tribal uh, tribalism with the idea of it's important to have communities. So when they say tribalism gives an evolutionary advantage, you could see it two ways. You could say, it is important to form communities, but forming communities and tribalism is something which not only is not the same, I would say it's almost contradictory. The one contradicts the other. Because what do you want from a community when you come together with other people and you have a name, you have a goal, you want to make sure that these people are people who can think, who can have independent objective judgment. So for example, we need to do this. And the higher the stakes, the more important this is. So let's say you go to war or you go to a revolution. You need people with this independent judgment. And you have similar values. For example, you value freedom. And you say, okay, we come together for this goal. But I don't give up my mind. I don't give up my values. We go together to war for a common cause. But we know what this cause is. And we know why we want to pursue this cause. That is one thing. That's, let's say, a, a community. A tribe is... I just happen to be with these people. And because they're my people, I have to go with them. An example that I got from a common friend of ours, from Greg Salmieri, he he mentioned the example of Robert Lee. And many people say that Lee was someone who didn't really believe in slavery. He was a good guy and all that stuff. But what did Lee do? He said, these are my people, therefore I have to fight. These are my community, therefore I have to fight for my community, good or bad. Yep. What a tragedy yep. this is. You recognize that your community is doing something immoral, slavery. So supposedly Lee recognized slavery as immoral. And yet he said, but it's my community. I have to go with the community. And, 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 and they owe 600,000 young people who are going to die as a consequence. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's so, real evil. Yeah, it's because it's one thing to say I'm with my community because I understand why we're on the right side and I will go to my death with them. And it's another thing to say, well, they're my community. I understand they are wrong, but you know, what can we do? They're, they're my tribe. So confusing the tribe with the community is not something which it's a mistake. Now, the other thing that you mentioned is tribalism an instinct. If tribalism was literally an instinct, this would mean that I don't have free will. Mm-hmm. If tribalism is an instinct, it means that I cannot switch it off, but we can switch it off. You see, for example, People starting as being tribalists and then not being tribalists, being independent thinkers, although it's super difficult, but it happens. You see people going the opposite direction and you even see societies being poisoned by this poison of tribalism. And then 20 years later and massacring each other. Rwanda Mm -hmm. is an obvious example, but not the only one. And you see the same society 20 years later, different culture, different ideas, or they have learned the lessons and they see the they see the world differently. So no, tribalism is not an instinct. It's not a gene. And I think this is what many people who try to understand tribalism make a mistake. And they also make the mistake. They say we need a little bit of tribalism. Why do you need a little a little bit of tribalism? Why do you need a little bit of surrendering your mind to someone else? So if let's say. The, the, the peak of tribalism is Rwanda and Macetis and massacring other people merely because they're part of a different group. Why would you need a little bit of that? You don't need any of that. And that's what that's how we should see. Yeah, any, any unity based on value is good, is tribal is not good. Yes. Okay. Yes. I mean, any bit of poison, any bit of tribalism is 
destructive to you. Um, so let's go through a, a, a few examples today, because if, if we think about historically, historically tribalism is focused on ethnicity, uh, uh, group affiliate, uh, you know, uh, uh, kin, kin, family. Um, it, it, it's focused on who you grew up with. That was the history of tribalism. I mean, we, we as, a, as a species, we used to live in tribes, tribes of multiple family members and family groups. And uh, that was the community in which we lived. But uh, something unique, I think, has happened, I'd say, over the last, I don't know how long, maybe you can, you can tell us, where tribalism has now moved from the, from the sphere of ethnicity, uh, from the sphere of people who look alike or come from the same background or share the same family genes, to a point where uh, it, tribalism is now ideological and, and, and all over the place. So talk a little bit about that, and then we'll, we'll get into some specific examples of both left and right. Yeah, so the question is, why now? And to answer the question, why now, we need to understand, again, what, what is the need for tribalism? The need for tribalism is that the world doesn't make sense. Therefore, I need to cling to a group to make sense of the world. So, well, it's more than it doesn't make sense, right? It doesn't make sense. And I can't trust the tool that's supposed to make sense for me. Exactly. I.e., I've been taught my entire life that I can't trust my reason. Exactly. All I have is emotion. I feel fear, which means I need to cling to the group to, to reduce my fear, right? Exactly. And if you, if you combine this, let's say, from the 60s with this idea of identity politics, with this idea that different group not only they are victims of injustice, in which way we should say, yeah, let's get together so that we alleviate this injustice. No, they are victims of injustice and they have to be victims of injustice because that's how they view the world. And this is how the world is set up. So, for example, in, if, you, if you hear people who talk about the patriarchy or who talk about white privilege and all that stuff, it's almost as if this is a static situation that can never be, never really be alleviated. Okay. So you, you, you have this idea that of group interest identity politics. At the same time, more and more and more and more that you cannot trust your reason. And this comes even from people who say there is a black reason, a white reason. Uh, as a woman, I think yes. As a black person, I think yes. But also from people who you would think they're more on the quote, our sides of the culture wars, people who don't like the left would say, who also tell you there is no free will who also tell you you are determined, who also tell you you can't make sense of the world. And this is when the world becomes a very scary place. This is where the world becomes like this painting by means, like the scream, where you're like, oh my God, what am I going to do? Yep. And what are you going to do? You look around, as Ayn Rand said, when, if I cannot trust my reason, somehow I have to make sense of the world. So I cling with people who look like me, same color, same skin, same gender, or by people who I decide they're my group because I hate so much the other group. That's what you see today with woke, anti-woke. Yep. And basically whatever the other group says, I'm the opposite. And we saw this with the vaccines, right? I mean, how interesting and pathetic that the same people who in October of 2020, they were saying the vaccines is the best thing in the world because God Emperor Trump gave us this vaccine in record time. Within months, they would switch their position altogether. That's what I found very interesting. They would switch as a group. So we are, there looks like in the culture, there is urge to cling with some people and form, let's say, your existential meaning together with, together with them. And you think that's driven by fear, uh, fear uh, because you can't trust your own thinking. You can't, and you're, you, you're told you're determined. You're told your reason is impotent. You're told and, to rely on your emotion, and that's all it leads to is to fear, so you huddle up in a group. And you, and you are constantly encouraged to view yourself this way. I mean, think about the university. You think about, for example, the things like diversity training and all that stuff. So, or that your skin color or your gender is having your life choices in a way very severely, it, it has a very severe impact on your life choices. And then sure. you tend to believe it and you say, oh, turns out, yeah, then I am my genes. Then I am my genitalia or my skin color. So it makes sense if you are bombarded with this and you have no intellectual defense to this to say, well, yeah, turns out, you know, how can I make sense of the world? And also you are constantly reminded 
how scary place the world is. Environmental yep. disaster, the patriarchy, capitalism, uh, or what are the fears of the right? Like uh, great replacement, immigration, globalization. So scary place and risks and fear everywhere. And this is a very fertile ground for tribalism. So uh, walk us through a little bit of kind of the, the, how we got to where we are today in terms of, let's start with the left, the tribalism on the left. How do we go from Marxism, which w- w- was supposedly intellectual, uh, uh, but how did, we, how did Marx kind of lead to where we are today? How did the new left in the 60s lead to where we are today? What, what's the story there on the left of the evolution of kind of the woke world in which we live now? So there are some germs or some, some roots already in Marxism because Marx epistemology is very unclear. He talks about this thing as false consciousness yeah. or some this idea that you've got working class consciousness and bourgeois consciousness. Now, he never explicitly says that the world cannot make sense, but it is somewhere there. But at least Marx had this idea of universalism, which is at the very end of the day, somehow, will manage to make sense of the world. He's not sure how, he doesn't tell you how, but at least there is this aspiration of universalism that that the working classes, let's say, is is going to encompass the human spirit. Now, from the 60s, with the new left, you don't have this anymore. So if you read the Frankfurt School, it's this depressing idea that the world doesn't make sense and the world cannot make sense. Because they There's say no that utopia. The, so the Marxist utopia is written out. There's no end game. There's there no is no end game. The end. There's no, there is no the end game. End. And I mean, they, you could say they are they have the cell shock from the Second World War and Nazism. So they said, look, you people believed in enlightenment, but look where enlightenment has led us: the Holocaust, the Gulag, and the nuclear bomb. As if the Nazis and the Stalinists were the embodiments of reason in the enlightenment. So But anyway, so the new left sees that since we gave up on enlightenment, we have to give up on the idea of these big narratives like freedom, reason, and all that stuff. Therefore, they say the best you can hope is that you deconstruct the current modes of oppression and then what? Then blank. Then we don't know what to do. So there's this almost inherent, almost nihilism that the best we can do is to fight the powers that be but we can't really know the truth. We can't really know what is right. And then you have other movements who say, well, we can't really know, but our reality as this group is different from the reality of this other group. Therefore, the best you can hope is to understand reality based on your group. Mm -hmm. So this is how we go from something like Marxism universalism to the idea that we can't know the truth to the idea of, well, since we cannot know the truth, the different groups live in their own different truths. And this is how we find ourselves today with this uh, black thinking and white thinking and female thing and all that stuff. And and what do you think the, what are the main manifestations of tribalism on the left today? The the most obvious one I think is uh, what most people understand as uh, critical race, uh, critical race thinking or, and why is this though? Because it's an open admission, it's an open acceptance that yes, indeed, the world does make sense through the prism of the group. And this is the idea of lived experiences. Now, because we have to be very careful to not straw man them, you could say that it does make sense that quite often you don't know how bad things are if you're not in this group. So for example, I've been, I've been reading the biography of Malcolm X mm-hmm. and I thought, oh my God, things were really bad. I did it. I knew that things were bad, but I never imagined they would be that bad. But the critical race theory will take a step further. They will say, even if you possess all the facts, even then you're not in a position to to pass judgment. We see the same discussion, for example, around the sexual assault and all that stuff, where you tell me, look, the statistics, my statistics say, and say, it's not about your statistics. It's about the live experience. If you're not a woman, you cannot really understand. And again, on a superficial level, there is something to it. Yeah, I will never be able to understand how scary it is, let's say, to walk alone at night. Sure. But this doesn't mean that I cannot make the value judgment of yeah. this is good and this is bad and this is 
you know, or this is how we can try to solve this problem. So in a way, we live in a tower of Babel where communication is important. Sorry, is impossible. I cannot understand you. You cannot understand me because it's impossible to share live experience. And then what can we do? We can be in a constant conflict on whose, quote, truth is going to supersede the other's truth. Well, that's why tribalism has to lead to violence. Tribalism cannot lead to peace. Rand writes about this in The Roots of War. Uh, she writes about it in Global Balkanization. Um, uh, the, the more we become tribal, the more we give up on reason as a, as a measure of, re, of, of truth, uh, there's nothing to debate. There's nothing to argue about. If I have a white mind and somebody else has a yellow mind um, and we each have our own truths and we each have our own reason, then we can never agree. There's, there's, and there's no mechanism by which we can show each other that we're wrong. So the only way to resolve any disputes is to see who's strongest and to, and to, and to, you know, to use warfare. And what I find very shocking is that this was exactly the way of thinking of people in the past that all would agree was horrible and wrong. So, for example, you have Carl Smith, like the Nazi in yep. his Nazi days, where he would say, "Look, I can understand that someone who is an alien—that's the term he would use—an alien would have his views, would make, let's say, a piece of art, and it might even be a good piece of art, or he would even make a good piece of, of argument." But it's alien art or alien argument. Yep. And you would, if you tell this to a class today, a class of Nazis, they would all agree, oh, my God, that was horrendous. Yeah. And then in the next class, they would be taught the similar mindsets in a different package where we would talk about cultural appropriation and things like that. And we would say, yeah, yeah, that, that does make sense. So the inability to see how bad these are, what is, is the bad history of these ideas, I find this very difficult to comprehend. Like it's. It's not, it doesn't even require a very deep no. analysis to understand the parallels between how these ideas in the past were shared by some very, very bad people. Thank you for listening or watching the Iran Brooks Show. If you'd like to support the show, we make it as easy as possible for you to trade with me. You get value from listening. You get value from watching. Show your appreciation. You can do that by going to iranbookshow.com slash support, by going to Patreon, subscribe star, locals, and just making a appropriate contribution uh, on any one, of those, uh, any one of those channels. Also, if you'd like to see the Iran Book Show grow, please consider sharing our content. And of course, subscribe. Press that little bell button right down there on YouTube so that you get an announcement when we go live. And for you, those of you who are ready subscribers and those of you who are ready supporters of the show, thank you. I very much appreciate it.